Hey everyone, doing something a little different for the ad at the beginning of the episode this week. Instead of spotlighting one particular sponsor, why don't you go over to our website and check out all of the sponsors that we have. UnitedWeDrink.com slash sponsors. We have a bunch of different stuff that if you give them your business, you're also giving United We Drink your business. American Homebrewers Association, Audible. Uh, you can subscribe to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. You can get beer from Beer Drop. You can get wine from Wink. You can get booze, spirits from Spirit Hub, homebrew supply stuff from Northern Brewer, uh, keg stuff, make your own kegerator, kegerators, faucets, everything from Micromatic, and our friends at FRW Studio for all your creative needs. So why don't you go over to unitedwedrink.com slash sponsors. You don't have to go to one particular place. Check out all of them. Uh, maybe check out a few. And if you like something there and you give them their business through the links that we have there on our page, you're giving us business. You're supporting this show. So, and we really appreciate that. So thank you once again and enjoy the episode. The opinions and statements in this podcast do not represent those of the hosts, employers, co-workers, family, or imaginary friends. Now enjoy the show. Happy hour? More like amateur hour. Welcome to United We Drink. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the only beer podcast that puts a lot of pressure on itself to come up with new and unique introductions every episode. Welcome to United We Drink, right here on unitedwedrink.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and wherever fine podcasts are found. My name is Mike Yurevich, and this is one of those episodes where I'm all by myself in the intro. That's because we have a interview a guest who is joining us for this episode this is an episode that should have happened months ago we are joined by our friend and colleague tim johnson from the bitter units podcast if you're not familiar with his podcast his beer podcast uh we certainly say you should check them out which how have you not we have all been on their show they joined us for a charity fundraiser in December to raise money for Feeding America, and he's just an overall great human being. We tried to do this interview, well, we did do this interview before, and we failed due to technical difficulties and recording issues. No one's to blame. <clears throat> uh, there is no episode. We did not get it out to you. So, Take two. Oh, darn. We get to hang out with Tim again, drink some beers and talk the talk shop for a little while. So it's a long one. I'm not going to lie to you. This is our longest episode that we've ever had. We thought that the last episode was long. Um, so this is right around an hour and 45 minutes of uh, Joel, Tim and I hanging out, talking shop, talking shit, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I'm not going to go into much else here. I'm going to save you the time to listen to our conversation with our good buddy, Tim Johnson from the Bitter Units podcast. All right. So we are joined once again, but for... The first time for you all listening by our friend, Tim Johnson. Tim, thank you for being here again. Absolutely. Uh, any, any excuse to hang out and, and have a beer with you guys, I will take. Uh, I will too. Uh, I still kind of think in the back of my head that Joel sabotaged those files last time just so <laughs> that we could do this again. <laughs> now... Uh, We've heard this story already, but we're going to have to go ahead and go get into a little bit of 
who you are and your background for those who don't uh, listen to your podcast, Bitter Units. Uh, we've done this before, <laughs> but uh, tell, <laughs> tell everyone <laughs> how you went from, you wish you could see this, uh, Joel's, Joel's uh, Zoom filter just came to life. <laughs> uh, tell everybody how you went from corporate America into brewing and then out of brewing. Yeah. So um, I, I was originally uh, a, a theater and design major and done, had done a billion other things. I probably had seven different careers before I got into brewing. Uh, but the last I, I, I got to stop this. I, I already feel ridiculous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so I, I already started um, uh, in the corporate world for probably 15 years before I got into brewing. But the last job that I was in prior to getting into brewing was at the headquarters of Buffalo Wild Wings. And I was on the food and beverage team. So I was working on beer programs. So it was very tangential to the brewing industry. Like I, I got to work on programs with, with uh, craft brew Alliance on some red hook projects, or I got to work with other breweries on, on beer related projects. I got to work with uh, guys like Mike Bell, who, if you open up the brewers association draft quality manual, and they think people in the beginning, like one of the guys that wrote that, um guys from like Miller Coors and AB guys that I was working with that taught me how to line clean are some of the guys that, that did that so I got a lot of that kind of that pre-brewing experience there um but then I started uh working part-time at a brewery in in Shakopee here in, in Minnesota uh as as a beer tender um while I was still working full-time in that corporate job and, and after a few months I'd finally decided, man, I, I can't, I can't do this. I knew I was going to be a father and I couldn't come home from a corporate job grumpy every day and think that I was going to be a good dad. And so I already kind of had this, this spot set up at the brewery that I was working where they needed help in production and I could work doing seller work and, and doing packaging work. Uh, and talk to them like, yeah, why don't you, you come in back and, and, uh, so after a few months, I just found them like, forget it. I'm going to get out of the corporate world. I'm going to go into working at this brewery and kind of see where things go and figure out what, what my next play is. Uh, not too long after that, the packaging manager at the time they had left so he could go be a stay at home dad. And they're like, well, hey, we have this opportunity for you to become our packaging manager. And oh, by the way, we will also sponsor you to do the American Brewers Guild program. Uh, and you know, you can, you can do all of that. We would love to have you come on. And so that's just sort of how I started off going from corporate beer nerd into actual real, you know, like I'd been a home brewer and all that for, for years, but to actually transition professionally is, is the way that, 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 that kind of went down and slowly just kind of did a little bit of everything around the brewery until eventually I was the head brewer at, at Badger Hill. That's, and how long, how long was that all together that, uh, that that took? I was, so I started there in 20, late 2014. And then I was head brewer then uh, in the fall of 2019. So it was a span of about five years between uh, beer tender to head brewer, which is pretty fast. Even at the time, I'm like, are you sure you guys want to do this? I don't, I don't know <laughs> what the fuck I'm doing, uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I had had some pretty good people ahead of me, a guy that I still like I was texting earlier today, uh, a guy who was a, a brewer back. He came from the East Coast. He was our head brewer and he moved back to the East Coast. Uh, he's like, no, you, you got this. You know, you understand these things. You've you've gotten the education. You've gotten the experience. And I'm always here as a resource. And he has been. And it's been great. Um, but like literally like the day that he told me he was leaving, then the owner said, okay, so Tim, we need to talk about the transition plan to you being head brewer. And I was like, wait, what a second. I just learned Chase was leaving like 
three minutes ago. Let's just back up. You guys could go interview someone who's smarter and better and whatever. You, like, I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to feel passed over. You, you can you can let someone else do this. And they're like, no, no, you understand the brewery. You understand how it works. You know, you, you've brewed the beer. You've packed. You've done it all. Like, like you can do it. So um, and then I was just dumb enough to say yes, I guess. It reminds me so much of, of kind of how I got into it because I was in cubicle hell and I just, I got to a point where I was like, I got to do something. I got to take a fucking chance. Like I just, you know, I, it was the same thing for me. Like I didn't want to come home miserable and stuff all the time. You know, I ended up, I ended up going from coming home miserable to coming home drunk. <laughs> <laughs> There's <clears throat> definitely that. And that's a different kind of miserable that you have to watch out for. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, the, uh, it's ironic without getting too kind of deep into the personal weeds here. Um, I, I'm convinced that like my, my path in, in brewing probably was a contributing factor to me getting a divorce. So the whole idea of me leaving corporate America to be a better husband and a better dad, and then end up getting divorced because of brewing, uh, the irony isn't lost on me, uh, for sure. Um, but I know that it was better for kind of my mental health and my mental well-being. And I, I didn't, I didn't come home from the brewery every day, hating life. Like I did when I worked in corporate America, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I feel a little weird that I I was, I wasn't working corporate America, but I was working an office job uh, doing it work for web hosting. And I didn't dislike it. It just wasn't, where my head was at and uh, this whole craft beer thing and it's it's strange looking back at like this month is nine months or nine years for me in this industry and i'm like fuck i was so just rose colored lenses and jaded back then about like i want to get into this industry i want to make craft beer and make something artsy (laughs) and the the romanticism of of this industry yeah, uh, R- right. The, the romanticism of the industry itself is is seductive. Uh, like, like, don't get me wrong. Like, so because before I had been at the headquarters of Buffalo Wild Wings, I had been at the headquarters of, of Best Buy up here in, in Minnesota. We have a lot of actually we, a pretty good amount of Fortune 500 companies for for a city our size. And so I'd spent a lot of time, you know, Best Buy paid for me to go to business school. So I had already done my undergrad and then I did grad school up here because Best Buy paid for it. And so there was a part where I was drinking that Kool-Aid and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to just climb some corporate ladder, be some business, whatever. I don't know, guy that wears khaki pants. And uh, <laughs> I, I owned way too many button down shirts and, and all of that. Uh, and so there was some kind of a lure of, of craft beer, right? That romantic, hey, we get to do something that's creative. Because, you know, I'd been, like I said, the art and theater major. And, and, but still, you know, there's science involved and there's all this and there's this camaraderie and there's all kind of that, that, uh, I don't want to call it all bullshit because it's not all bullshit, right? There's still a, a ton of great things about that that are true. And the reason why I'm not going to go back to corporate America and craft beer is probably my future for until my hips quit working. Um, but uh, there is something probably seductive about it. So, yeah, I, I Mike, I, I absolutely get that. Like, hey, I'm working this thing where it's it's almost mind numbing during the day to something where it feels like liberating. Yeah. It's, it's almost strange to say that the frustrations that I deal with in the craft beer industry, in my job on a day to day basis, make me feel more alive than just sitting at the cubicle answering tickets and phone calls about people who are just mad that they're, website isn't working although it's amazing how many times in both craft beer and in it where if you ask someone did you turn it off and turn it back on again (laughs) (laughs) it really does (laughs) the answer kind of applies in both both scenarios frankly yeah it it really does um so 
then you're you were at uh Badger Hill, right? Yes. And then you decided after some time that you needed some time off and you wanted to change your your life a little bit and take a break. Yeah. And uh ex- explain that. Yeah, so you know, it it's not Things were things were good at at, at Badger Hill. Like a, a like a smarter person or someone from the outside would be like, "What kind of idiot leaves the situation that you're in?" Um, but I, it, like I said, I'd gone through a divorce. Um, th- things were just were different. We had gone through a lot of changes at Badger Hill. Uh, we had done some op prop kind of brewing with other brands and for other brands type of things. And there'd just been a lot of turmoil. There'd been ownership changes. There had been a lot of things going on at the brewery. And then in my, my personal life where it's like, I, I need a change. Um, I had learned a long time ago earlier in my corporate life that uh, don't stick onto a job just because you need the job. Like the idea of just needing a job and, and then doing it is not a recipe for happiness. And like, I get that I am privileged enough that I had made enough money that I could, I had the luxury of making this decision. Like I wasn't so forced into, I have to do this. Um, but, but man, if you're not happy, it's not, it's not worth it. You are not your job. No matter how much you identify by what you've done, uh, what you know, what you studied to be, how long you've dedicated to something. If if something is going wrong in your life, you need to address it because you're going to just be a better person to the people that you love and the people around you, and you're going to be happier. And you know, man, if if I could live off in a cabin in the middle of nowhere and just sustain and be happy, I would do that rather than to feel like I have to be tied to a job. So while I loved uh, Badger Hill and I still love them, I still talk to those guys. I was, you know, I was texting one of them uh, earlier today. Um, I I just knew that there was time for a change, and I thought maybe I had some kind of ideas on the horizon. Uh, single dad i said okay i'm gonna go ahead and step away from 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 this i had a couple of ideas on the back burner where maybe i could consult in some other areas uh do some other things um i also had some some like personal health issues going on that i probably needed to take time to address uh joel and i have talked about this before like it's very easy to neglect both your physical and mental health in a brewery for oh, yeah. sure like 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 y- you don't for, first of all the job even when you aren't the guy lifting up a, a 55 pound sack of grain to mill in every day uh even when you're not throwing kegs all around it's still a very physically demanding job uh the readiness of alcohol is not a a healthy benefit of the job by any means, right? Uh, and then there's a whole lot of other kind of stressors going on at you that the industry doesn't necessarily know how to handle or address. Uh, some places are great at it, uh, I, I should say. And, and I'm not saying that Badger Hill wasn't, but it's just, it's a young company. The, the whole industry deals with a lot of like young companies, a lot of first time owners, a lot of first time people dealing with some of these things. And so, uh, you know, I, I needed to, for me and for my daughter, make sure that my mental health was in a better space. And, and, you know, like, like Joel said, not, you know, just coming home drunk every day, uh, but just be in a better space and, and, and make sure that I was regulating how much I was drinking versus what mental health medication I was on or any of those things. Yeah. I mean, Um, when you were saying you don't have to be lifting the heaviest stuff to deal with physical pain. One of my least favorite things to do is really on packaging days. I'm normally the guy at the end of the the line who's grabbing cans off of the conveyor and putting them into case trays while someone else pack texts them and puts them onto a pallet. And I'm just going like shifting, like 
pivoting from left to right, from left to right. And just my hips and my, my back, just feeling that constant, just rotation after about 30 minutes fucking sucks. And, yeah. and you have these cans just coming right at you and you're like, Oh, let me just, I'll just crack one open. And I did it the other day. And uh, I was like, no, like, what am I doing? <laughs> right. And just like dumped it out on the floor drain. Um, but yeah, it, it's so easy to just be like, fuck this pain. I'm just going to, I'm just going to have a beer while I'm doing this. Right. And then that could end up turning into two or three. I've heard of people getting fucking sloshed on, yeah. on canning lines. And I'm like, yep. fucking th- those things are dangerous. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cause you know, stuff like that, like repetitive motion or being on your feet or all that stuff. I mean, man, I'm in my forties and last night I yawned and I thought I pulled every muscle in my core. <laughs> like I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, there's there's oh. muscles you don't know that, <clears throat> that you feel when you, when you do shit like that. And then, yeah, just the readily available in the fact that the culture is so permissive of you doing that. Right. You know, I spent, yeah. I spent 15 years in the corporate environment. And if I would have just been like, Oh, I'm having a rough day. Let me crack a beer at my desk. That, you know, that shit isn't going to fly, but in a brewery, it's like, well, no, we, you know, we, we all do that. Um, and, and I get that. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's all bad to be permissive like that, but it does uh, create a situation where you may, you maybe need to be more aware of, how you're behaving and how you're treating that, that physicality and and all of that as well. Yeah. One of my favorite things, and I say that sarcastically is uh, the alternating of uppers and downers. So it's like cranked up on energy drinks and coffee and shit all morning, getting ready to just get through the day. And then all of a sudden there's this period where you're like, Oh shit, I've had way too much caffeine and stuff. Now I need something to bring me down or my heart's going to explode Where's the beer? I, I said that that literally happened to me uh, on Thursday because I normally get the 12 ounce coffee, but I had had a bad night of sleep. And so I got the 16 ounce coffee. And even though it was only 30% more coffee, I could like feel my heart jumping out of my chest. And I had done a good job through the morning. But at one point in the afternoon, I'm like, I I'm still way too wired. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's, it's afternoon. I, I can go ahead and, and I'll have half a beer. And, and then like the second I, I did that, I was like, man, uh, just because I went too high in the stimulant doesn't mean that I need to regulate it with a depressant. Like that's, that's the yeah. wrong way to approach that. Um, uh, but I mean, it's, it, it's right there. It's the easy fix. It's not the right fix, but yeah, I absolutely had that conversation uh, uh, with someone like, Hey, well, at least I'm doing the healthy thing that both my heart and my liver are really going to just love me for, for doing this. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's literally a good beer hunting beer festival. Yeah. Yeah. Uppers and downers. And beer. And what, yeah. what really sucks is like when the, you know, let's say the two shift beers or whatever kind of doesn't even bring you down. It just kind of regulates you back to about even, but you know, you're still going, the work is still going. It's past five o'clock. It's still hot as balls in the warehouse and you're sweating and you like, you don't even feel like you've had a downer. You just kind of feel like you've, you've kind of regulated yourself back to about even but now there's alcohol in your system and you think like, oh, well, I'm fine. I've had a couple. I don't feel anything. I can have more. That's a fucking dangerous slope. Yeah. I mean, your whole idea of what even is has now shifted, right? Yeah. And, th- and that gets to be kind of a scary of, of, oh, yeah, no, this is my normal. Wait, this is my normal? My normal is actually two beers deep? Like, th- like that starts to become <laughs> uh, a-, a place where, where you have to realize – I, I guess that's you know the term functioning alcoholism, right? Um, uh, but there is but there is some of that sense where you just get kind of used to it and it becomes a norm. So you have to watch out for that. So uh, to get back because we've we've kind of digressed here, um, uh, you know, I had a lot of those things going on, so I did decide to take that time off 
uh, from that job and from the industry. And then I thought I had some other kind of projects lined up. Uh, my daughter, her daycare closed originally temporarily for the, the pandemic, but then just said, no, we just need to be closed for good. And so now I'm a single dad trying to navigate, well, I can't get her into new daycare. I need to focus on, on being a single dad and, and stay at home dad and all of that stuff. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to dive all the way into this. And then the pandemic as well also said, Hey, you know, those other projects that you had lined up, uh, they're not going to happen now because no one's doing things. And so I'm like, well, perfect. I'm going to dive full in on being a dad and a stay at home dad. And again, I have the luxury of the money I'd made from, from my, my corporate career and, and, uh, not being such an idiot when I was younger that I, I'm like, I, I can take time uh, to do this and uh, it'll be healthy for me to get away from brewing, to get away from the industry, to, to look at it from an outsider's perspective. And so that's what I did. Uh, and then like, I started working for this website, the tailgate society and, and about like a month into that, then my now podcast co-host said, well, hey, you're in beer. Why don't we go ahead and do something about beer? I'm like, well, good. I, I need a break from beer, so let's have a podcast about beer. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I, I didn't really get away from it uh, for that long, um, but it was a different approach, and, and I appreciated the, the different perspective it brought. And you segued yourself pretty well into then talking about Bitter Units, your podcast. Yeah. Uh, that we, uh, we've we each been on. Joel's been on twice now. Is he, is he the only two-time guest uh, that isn't like a host? Um, n- no, he is the second. Neil Stewart uh, from Deschutes. Um, made a second appearance. He was a guest, and then we had my friend Michael Wagner from Steel Toe Brewing here in in the Twin Cities on, and they are both West Virginia grads, and Aaron and I are Iowa State grads, and before the Iowa State-West Virginia football game, then we had Neil come back on kind of as like a surprise second guest uh, so that Michael didn't feel overwhelmed by people that were making bets. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we bet each other a, a bunch of beer on the game. And that was nice because those, those guys actually paid up. Um, but uh, that was kind of just a, I don't know, spur of the moment thing. Um, but yeah, Joel's been nice enough to kind of fill in as, as a guest host for us. So, so uh, we have definitely appreciated that as well. And we also did our our charity uh, live stream back in December. We we raised a good chunk of money for Feeding America. That was a lot of fun. We we combined our efforts of our podcasts, which is still low effort. But uh... <laughs> no, actually, Mike, that's not true. That was surprisingly high effort. The amount of time that you and I spent trying to figure out oh, how to how yeah to even just do a live stream. I, I kind of erased that from my memory. So th- <laughs> thanks for bringing up uh, my my flaws in technology. It wasn't just, I didn't know what I was doing either. Like we both just went, come on, kids can do, like kids live stream them playing <laughs> video games. Clearly we can figure this out. And then we got on them like, we don't, we don't, we don't know what we're doing. It makes yeah. you, it makes you feel even worse about knowing there's eight year olds making $10 million a year on un- unboxing like Pokemon cards and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck those kids. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I say that without, with all love and sincerity for kids. I have a six year old kid. Fuck, fuck them those kids. kids. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us a little bit for, for those that don't listen to bitter units and shame on you uh, about the show. Yeah. So like I said, uh, I started working uh, with, so a friend of a friend started this website called the tailgate society. And he'd been telling me, Hey, you, you could come join. You could, you could come write. And I'm like, you've never seen me write or anything. Why would you want me to? Um, and I think I've made him regret that decision ever since then. Um, 
uh, but we started talking with people on there and bouncing around ideas and Aaron Wall, who was our kind of de facto host for, for bitter units. Uh, he and I, like we found out we grew up five miles apart from each other. We went to rival high schools, all of that thing. We didn't know each other. We went to high school at the same time. We went to Iowa state at the same time. We didn't know each other until this, this came up. Um, but he said, Hey, I have an idea where, because Tim, you like to tell people everything they're doing wrong with beer. Uh, and I'm a beer dummy. Why don't we have this, this podcast where, uh, everything you're doing to piss off everyone else, at the tailgate society telling them that they're dumb. Why don't we turn that into a podcast? And, uh, so like, well, we need a third voice. We need like a, like a different voice, like a craft beer, like the guys, the people that I'm pissing off, we need those. So we need you, Aaron, as a beer dummy and me as the quote unquote beer expert. And then the craft beer fan. And we need to have that be, uh, what the show is about. So we started off just doing this podcast where the three of us talk about beer or, you know, I would quiz them on beer things and stuff like that. I'm like, you know what? Really the, the format should be that we get a guest from the industry. And so the podcast is first half is we talk to a guest. We learn about what is going on in the world of beer from their perspective. And then the second half, we always taste a beer that is of the guest choice. So whether that's a beer that they produce, whether that's just one of their favorite beers, um, I don't remember what you guys chose. Uh, Sierra Nevada Oktoberfest yes, was mine. Right, and then Joel, were were you were, were you just High Life? What were you? It was probably High Life, but I, I think honestly don't remember. I, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Phil was Saison DuPont. Phil was Saison DuPont. Yeah, I thought about that the, uh, the other week because we were recording Duval. I'm like, oh, good. Another uh, Belgian beer that I'm going to drink way too much of and feel both bloated and drunk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, so the idea is we, we talk about the industry. We drink some beer. We talk about how the beer is made. We uh learn a little bit we you know tell stories we, it's mostly just an excuse for me to to get guys like you on that are my friends virtually and from afar and all of that that I'd, i don't get to see otherwise and find an excuse to to have a beer over a zoom call and record it and make people listen to it and uh you've been lucky enough lately to be having people on who are pretty good names in the industry and probably have expense accounts to be able to send a beer to three different people across the country of their own beers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm fucking jealous about because I would have loved to send all three of you guys, some of my beers, uh, which your box is going in the mail this week. Cause we're canning up something new that I want to send out you and Tommy oh. Kelly. Oh, wonderful. Uh, we actually just had Tommy Kelly. We just recorded with Tommy Kelly last night. So yeah, I saw, nice. I saw that you guys were doing that. Yeah, man. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wish that I could have sent you guys that, but that would have probably cost me like 150 bucks <laughs> <laughs> just in shipping to send out three boxes. Yeah. I've, I now have, I'm looking at, yeah, you guys can't see this and certainly the listeners can't see this, but I'm looking over. I've picture acquired, if you will. Uh, yes, picture if you will. I've acquired so many of those uh, whale pods, beer shippers. I've uh, never seen those until you sent them to me. And then Tommy, when he sent me a box, it was in one of those too. I'm like, the oh, oh, they're they're the best. That like someone, even though like none of like whether it's UPS or FedEx or the postal service wants to say that 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 they will. Uh, some of them don't even say they won't ship alcohol, but they don't, they don't care. And so like literally the, the shipping industry basically, went, you know what, we can create these boxes that are perfect for sending yeast samples or whatever the hell you want to call these things. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm sending beer to Aaron to, to in Washington or JT Dunn in Des Moines or, or to you guys or whatever. Um, it's a nice, easy way to do, to do it. Not that I'm, here to plug a sponsor a whale hey whale pods hit me up and if you want to be a bitter unit sponsor please let me know uh, uh I, I can cut an ad for you guys pretty quick 
You know, it, it's, it is funny with the, the pandemic. I feel like those shipping companies have eased up a bit uh, mm -hmm. on some of that stuff. I remember back in like 2013 or something, I reached out to people from FedEx and UPS and tried to get them to explain to me like, why, why can't I leave as a, like a manufacturer of alcohol send beer through the mail? And they're like, well, one of them just said, well, we just don't. One of them had a pretty good explanation. I mean, at least gave an explanation that I don't remember which it was, but that they said the carbonation of the beer causes a threat for pressure buildup and explosions in the package. I'm like, Hey, at least they're giving me an uh, an excuse uh, but they, but they and backing it up give a little a shit bit. If you shipped soda, yeah, <laughs> right, right. It, I think the bigger thing is it comes down to to tax dollars. Let's be honest. Like, yeah, I mean, one of the the dumbest things in this industry, I are taxes, right? Right, right folks. <laughs> yeah. If I can step <clears throat> on my libertarian soapbox here. Um, <laughs> no. So, and like, I shit, like, I'm proud to be part of the industry and I shit talk a lot of the things that are problems with the industry, but I do that as sort of like an insider that wishes we could be better and knows we could be better and, and yeah. worked in other industries that know we could be better. And so a lot of times I'm like, here's a problem with the industry and here's a problem with the industry and here's a problem with the industry. And it sounds like I hate the industry. I don't. I love the industry, but I know that we're capable of so much more. Uh, so I'm, I'm more like a disappointed father, um, <laughs> which, which is fine because I'm sure my dad feels like a disappointed father all the time. Um, but I, one of the things that is so weird about us is that our industry is more regulated by the tax and trade bureau than we are by the FDA. Not that we aren't regulated by the FDA. There's certain FDA regulations, but I never ever feared the FDA was going to show up once. I was way more concerned about what the tax man was going to say about how my cans were labeled or how they were shipped or how they were distributed or any of those things. Right. Like, yeah. Like if, if my beer is going to be legally distributed across state lines, I don't have to tell the FDA, hey, I'm going to, to legally distribute my beer across straight lines, but I have to tell the, the TTB that I'm going to do that. And so I think when it comes to shipping beer out, even though it's free, it's samples, it's all that stuff, uh, I think probably the bigger thing is, is why a UPS or a FedEx is they don't want to be complicit, I guess, in maybe the, the unlawful, untaxed distribution of beer. And I, I do get that because I know that there's people who probably take shortcuts on filling out their taxes, but I, mean, I, I'm now working in my second brewery to where I am the tax person. I do them every month for my state, every quarter for, for the feds mm -hmm. and like every can that I know is being taken out or bottle or whatnot, I account for on the taxes. We pay tax on them. Mm -hmm. If we, if mm -hmm. we're giving them away, I, I know that my bosses, they hate the fact that like, why are we paying on this? Like, like it, we shouldn't have to, if we're just giving it away, like it's being removed from our inventory. Like we got to account for it and just take the in. Like we, we aren't going to give away that much. Like, so like try to account for how much is being given away and be, and give me an amount that you say is, is okay and not okay and that's the way smaller breweries can do it is, is set yourself a, a max on how much you want to give away a month and mm -hmm. there you go well and 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 to be perfectly fair i think sometimes to be fair to be fair uh, i think Joel the reason understand. <laughs> i don't i <laughs> <laughs> i think the reason that that people get so upset about it is because they still think of of that at, like what we alluded to earlier that craft beer is this romantic little niche yeah. little art fair farmers market type of industry artisan handcrafted <laughs> right made beer right project. down the street right right yeah 
don't ever forget that artisanal is literally just art is anal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> just the idea that it's all like this, oh, it's like we're just one step up from homebrewers, but any other industry also has to account for all this shit. Yeah. Right. And and they're regulated up the ass and all this stuff. Hell, if we were craft milk producers, right? If I had artisanal dairy cows, uh, and and I was shipping my 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 cage free, wireless, conflict free milk across state lines, people are going to care a lot more about it, and so they're going to want to account for every pint of these things. And and so we all get like, oh, we shouldn't account for all those things, but every other industry does. And coming from corporate America, I can tell you they care way more. Like I, I remember there was a project that we worked on at Buffalo Wild Wings where we wanted to switch the muddler that the bartenders used. Just the just just a a stick they crush fruit in the bottom of a shaker pint. Right, like that, you could do that with a dirty spoon, um, and that was a project. It wasn't like a a one second decision. It was a project, because once you get the FDA involved, once you get USDA involved, once you get all those involved, they all want to make. Well, is that is that like an approved muddler? Is that gonna like cause herpes and cancer and, and, and some of the bartenders who are partial to the old one are going to keep that one and they're going to keep on using it. Like when you switch from the Boston stapler to the swing line. Right. One. Ex exactly. And, and so, and so all of the customers that we serve as brewers, they're dealing with way more regulations that we are. And so whenever we complain about, Oh, I, I, I can't send cans across the border. Well, well, of, of course not, dude. <laughs> nice. Uh, Joel is, is holding up a Milton uh, Funko, so that's that's perfect. I got the whole. I got everybody right next to me oh, at my desk. Fantastic. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> hey, that's a good reminder of why I left corporate America. Because uh, there are. I mean, that is kind of the part, right? Is like corporate America has to deal with TPS reports, and brewing doesn't have their own TPS reports. TTB so ones. We do have TTB reports, but even then. Man, Mike, you're talking about the, the the tax forms. Some of those felt like when I was doing that, that felt heavily redundant. Did you see uh, my conversation with Bart Watson about the TTB reports? I did not. I've had my own conversations with Bart about that. So uh, I, I have a, an idea of maybe what you're getting at. I threw the dude for a loop. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of weeks ago, he reported on um that uh off or own premise sales are starting to increase after the last quarterly report that came out and i go to him because i use the uh the short form ttb report yeah. there are two different types of ttb reports that you can fill out as a brewer there is a short form one page one or there's a two page like multi-lined one that's way more uh in depth you can use either one, as far as I'm aware. I I think the lar I, there's a there's a barrel limit. I think before where they they quit okay. letting you use the short form. Uh, so I use the short form. Always have, uh, not always. Actually, I used to when I first got into this was using the long form. Learned about the short form. Started using the short form, and I asked Bart. I go, so how do you determine own premise when this report? doesn't have that it just puts all sales into one line mm -hmm. and he's like i have never seen this before mm -hmm. i have never been aware that this existed i'm going to reach out to them took them i guess about two weeks to get back to him and he's like they take everything that you if you fill out the short form and they lump it into own premise mm -hmm. and like we distribute probably more than half of our uh our sales are distribution. So he's like, yeah, that skews my numbers that yeah, I, I, I come up with. Yeah. Th that, that doesn't surprise me at all. I had a very similar kind of conversation with him before because I, 
you know, until I was head brewer, I don't think I knew this, but when I started doing a lot of the reporting, I realized a lot of the reporting that you see in craft brewing that whether the Brewers Association puts out or scan data or like any of that stuff, I'm not saying it's all bullshit, um, <laughs> but I'm saying that it's... There's a good bit of bullshit. There's a lot of rounding and lumping and all of that that goes into it, which, you know, it really becomes, when you think about the, the beer sales as a whole, right? If, if I'm the tax man, I'm not worried about Copper Point or Badger Hill or some of these, you know, 3,000 yeah. barrels a year. I don't give a shit. You're getting, you're getting the same amount from us, whether we do the long form or the short form, because right? it's all about barrels. Yeah. But it's yeah. just not broken down into what we sent to distribution as opposed to what we sold on premise, as opposed to uh, what was given away to employees, what was broken, what was this, that, and the other. And if your taxes are 50% off in the terms, like in the scheme of, of craft beer or even beer in general, it's such a minor, minor, minor thing that people aren't really going to do that like worry about it too much on the small scale. It's kind of that as that all aggregates or maybe that's where it creates larger rounding errors than I think uh, someone like Bart necessarily understands. Which by the way, Bart Watson's the economist for the Brewers Association. So he's the numbers guy. Yeah, <laughs> really, really smart guy. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, but like, this is maybe a whole other podcast that we could have about the Brewers Association. Uh, <laughs> Do we want to go there with the last week that they've from had? What's going on in the industry? Uh, um, uh, yeah, there's there's a whole other conversation to be had about that, man. Uh, we we might need to create a, like an alias podcast to just talk about that, um, or talk about the TV show Alias. Oh yeah, we could we could we could do that. Um, one of J.J. Abrams' early works. <laughs> Joel, Joel doesn't even know how to respond to that. Um, I'm I'm happy to just like I've been blasting the fucking Brewers Association, and I don't care. Like, my boss comes to me and goes, "Hey, tone it down." Like, I'll be like, "Fuck that." Yeah, you know, man, I've I've. I've always had my issues with it because I just don't feel like they a actually represent. Uh, you know, I always had my issues when the whole uh, upside down bottle independent label yeah. thing came out. Um, why should Boston beer that creates a brewery called uh, Concrete Beach in Southern California that never South tells Florida. people or South, South Florida never says that they're going to um, Never tells people explicitly, hey, we're Boston beer, make it look like they're a local brewery, uh, that they're independent. They're owned by a multinational publicly traded company, and they get to be independent just because they're not owned by a private equity firm. Like it, Oh, it, and they've they've upped the limit on on craft beer's definition in order to barrelage. Yeah, to well, placate to them. You know, I Guys like my friend Dave Berg at Shells that have, have spent decades in this industry and watched the Brewers Association say they aren't craft and they are craft and they aren't craft and they are craft. Like all of that bullshit. Um, I get what they're getting at. I do believe they provide good resources. But even like I mentioned earlier, the draft quality manual. I, I get frustrated that more brewers don't use the draft quality manual. I get frustrated that I that I talk to brewers on forums or at events that don't know the basics about uh, proper serving pressure, proper gas mix, using the McDantum Easy Blend uh, app to figure out uh, what the total volumes of CO2 they have going on. There are all of these tools that are available to them, and I'm constantly referring people back to the draft quality manual. I think it is a great manual. You open that up and you see the guys who contributed to that and wrote that manual. And it's a bunch of people that work for breweries that are not considered craft breweries. Uh, and so the Brewers Association has very much, in my opinion, had a uh, 
have my cake and eat it too attitude when it comes to breweries of independence or craft or whatever rather than make good beer because i don't care if you're you're independent and making shitty beer there's no there's no nothing about an upside down bottle tells me you're making good beer yeah. um and and if you don't have that it doesn't tell me that you're not making good beer and i and i, I don't want to say that um I don't want to say that who owns a brewery or the practices that they exhibit or the way they treat their, their employees isn't important because it absolutely is important, but there's nothing about an upside down bottle that says, Hey, you're paying fair wages. Hey, you're listening to your employees. Hey, you're not storing your boat back where we should be storing <laughs> cans. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, it's a, uh, it's this weird. Uh, Are you just reciting my timeline right now? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it is this this weird uh this weird idea um <clears throat> that that we have conflated craft with quality uh well again that's why i, I said artisanal is just art is anal like it doesn't it doesn't they don't comport with reality and, and I think that's the struggle that I have is I would rather have people advocating for the things that I really care about. Uh, you know, it, it's no secret that craft beer right now is going through a well overdue reckoning. And I have not been impressed with the way that the quote unquote leaders of craft beer have handled anything. And I feel um, like with what's been happening lately, it's, how do I explain this? Like it's, it's showing exactly what you just said. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, it's peeling back those layers and, and showing people that, Hey, like you can be a local artisanal craft, independent, whatever, and look at what you're still capable of. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't, that was my entire problem with that fucking logo was like, it doesn't mean all, all it does is tell you about the brewery's ownership. And even then it's kind of uh, even, even then it didn't. So a oh, South Florida brewery owned by Boston beer, that, that money isn't going back into South Florida. Well, I... Joel, I know Joel's opinionated about this because Joel, <laughs> we, and, and actually I am too, because we we've gone we've gone to concrete beach and we know people who work at concrete beach and still work at that brewery now dogfish head miami mm -hmm. um their head brewer is still the same guy that that brewery is way bigger than i thought it was going to be and i don't know if i've said this on the show before but when they announced that i thought it was going to be seven barrel system they do a few like things in house but everything's made at sam facilities in cincinnati pa and whatnot fucking places a 30 barrel brew house canning line lager tanks lager tanks like a huge yeah, facility I, and i and don't get me wrong i'm not trying to talk shit about that brewery like they don't do good craft beer and they don't serve the community and they don't employ local people they do all of that and i absolutely get that and i appreciate that but to pretend like a independent or local means quality or b that you know i i get that I, I don't know what local means to me, right? Like, to me, uh, Chipotle is more local than the quote-unquote locally owned seafood place here in, in Minnesota. Because I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with where Minnesota is. Uh, <laughs> we don't have locally sourced seafood. But you got a thousand lakes. But we, we have 10,000 lakes. Oh, uh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Let, hey, let, don't undersell the, the amount of lakes we have. Um, but we don't, we're not sourcing our ingredients locally. That local owner actually spends more of his time in Martha's Vineyard than he does in, in, <laughs> uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, so, yeah, they're employing locally, whereas Chipotle, they're also employing locally, and they're actually getting ingredients from farmers in, in Minnesota. So who's who's – oh, by the way, that's, a, that's probably a franchise, and the franchise owner actually lives in, in Brooklyn Park, right? So, so who's more local, the national brand yeah. that's a local franchise or the 
the local business that is owned by someone else. And I guess that's my challenge with not to say that concrete beach isn't making great beers or employing local or whatever, but it's not independent. And it's certainly, you know, at the end of the day, the money rising to the top, that's making someone rich. They're not making a local person rich nearly as much as they're making someone not local rich. And, and this I think goes down to its core is that the, the craft beer definition is a bullshit thing yes. that has no legal standing whatsoever. And who fucking cares? Like, I, I know that's a rhetorical question. I know there's people that care because there are people who've debated me on this online online. And I'm I, like, you're, you're more than welcome to feel it. I felt that at one point. I felt that in like 2010, 2011, when I was first getting into beer. And then when I landed a job in 2012, I was even more stoked. I, I wanted to be that punk rock, punk rock kid that I, I was when I was playing music and fuck the man and th this punk, like craft beer is punk rock. It's fucking not. And like, there are people who are doing beer punk rock. And they're not, they don't give, a, they don't give a fuck about a definition that, uh, that this company in Boulder says, and, and like, I, I go back to Tim and, and, and repeat his statements that the Brewers Association does some good things, but they have no legal standing to say that they get to define craft beer. And I'm waiting for the day that one of the, one of the big breweries just says, fuck it and challenges that because they're they're already starting to do it when they buy up breweries and they're advertised as craft beer in uh, chain restaurants and 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 big box stores and whatnot. Like they they can say that if they want to. It doesn't mean anything, and it may turn into one of those generic terms that you know what we're just going to say it, it's free game to anyone. And like we work in beer, beer. Well, yeah. And some of them, us are smaller than others. Some of us have different ethics than others. And, uh, well, and so us... I, 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 I hate to keep picking on, on concrete beach, but <laughs> the, the flip side here is because they are owned by Boston beer, they probably have better practices. They probably treat their employees better. Right. Um, Safer. Yeah. Right, safer environments, better quality better pay, control, better benefits, better quality control, all of those things. They're doing more things right. Um, and so now you're just conflating breweries, and I think that's the part that gets difficult for me too. You know, Shells was not cra a craft beer for the longest time, and they're one of the 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 uh, not only are they one of the oldest family owned, continuously family owned breweries. Uh, they've been one of the like oldest run uh, union shops forever, right? And so their brewers are treated better than ninety nine point nine percent of the breweries here in in Minnesota. So if you're going to say, "Hey, we care about people," because I think that's that's part of the thing that goes hand in hand that people assume with craft and local and artisanal is that it's all. We care about the people. And, yeah. Right. To, to me, it, it goes back to what you were saying much earlier in the show about the romanticism of it. I think to me personally, it's my opinion that the independent logo, and I'm going to sound like a total conspiracy theorist. And this is probably like the most like hardcore I've gone with this. Foil. But, <laughs> but um, I think that logo is meant to, continue the the all right the the propaganda the 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 idea that you know ownership matters and like to a lot of people it does like like the, the independent logo tells people hey your money is going to an independent brewery and not some macro whatever but what does that mean i mean yeah who cares why is that important i mean i i could name i I've looked at so so many problematic beers that we've seen like on the old worst beer blog page, independent logo on the can. Right. You know what I mean? Whether it's fucking dirty blonde ale or it's an exploding smoothie or whatever it is, 
you know, so that logo means shit to me. Yeah, and, I, I mean, I, I can think of 450 beers uh, north of you guys <laughs> uh, that I, I would not feel comfortable purchasing just because they had uh, an upside down bottle on their can. Um, oh. <laughs> I mean, can, can they at least change the the independent logo to like a bulging can? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I mean, so I, you know, when we, I, I, I remember like first getting into beer and, and because it appeals to a younger crowd, there is absolutely a romanticism to like, Hey, we're the good guys. Like we're not the man you know, come drink craft beer and fight the power and support local. And, you know, everyone's, you know, slathering themselves in patchouli and putting on suspenders and fucking getting excited. And it's like, there are so many of these fucking breweries, like, uh, you, you yeah, know, I, what, I guess, folks, you have bought boats, you have bought convertibles for these people, for these owners. And, you have bought them country club memberships. <laughs> you have bought them so much shit that and probably more so than people have fucking health insurance inside of this industry. Think yeah, of it, yeah. but, but independent. They're but, independent, but, though. But it's not even about boats and, and country club ownerships and all of that, because some of that, it's not just the, the young kids slathering on the patchouli and the overalls, uh, which is God, a, a, I fucking hate patchouli. Um, <laughs> well, but there's also a good contingent of of boomers and ex hippies also slathered in patchouli that also bought into the romanticism about craft beer. Um, because one of the best things about this industry is is how open and sharing we are, how non secretive we are. Uh, if Joel ever asked me what a recipe of one of my beers was i i wouldn't ever be like secretive or what i mean beers like pesto man like it it it, it really is like i know what ingredients go into pesto don't don't be like secret and be like well looks like it lately too <laughs> 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 and I'm like, well, I've got olive oil. I'm like, maybe some kind of not, and I'm not going to tell you what. And like some kind of leafy green, and I'm not going to tell you. Like, like, no, we know what goes into this shit, right? Like, pro, like I could give seven breweries the same recipe, and I'm going to get seven different beers out of that. You see that for for breweries that that contract out to different places. That like how hard it is to make sure that each facility is actually producing the same the same product um, because there are challenges there. Uh, and so it becomes a double-edged sword of like how open and collaborative and how much we work together on all of these things uh, that we kind of buy into our own bullshit about what a brotherhood. And, <clears throat> and I, em and I emphasize brotherhood because it is, de there's definitely a bro culture there, but like how much we're like, Oh no, we all get along. And so it becomes this, this kind of self-perpetuating mythology of, of, hey, we're all buddy buddy, uh, that we don't acknowledge that just loving each other isn't enough to fix our problems. I call it the hashtag craft beer circle jerk. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like, it's a wonderful ideal and I hope we all strive toward it and everything, but at the same time, we know so many aren't living up to it. And, you know, you say, you know, you're happy to share with me and I, I'd be happy to share with you. And I, let me get out of here. I, I, <laughs> no, sorry. No, Here's, this is, this is, this is a good podcast. Sad. Hi. Sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, so obviously it, it's it, it's that romanticism that attracts everyone to it, right? And I, yeah. you know, I've spoken before about how it's very glorified and glamorous online, 
but once you actually get into it, you know, you, you see the, the darker side of it. And like you said before, like there's plenty of things to still love about it. And I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it because I remember how miserable I was before it doing something I hated. But I'm not just going to fucking stick my head in the sand and, and act like everything's OK and put up with a lot of shit just because this is better than that. And, right. you know, I've seen plenty of instances where like people are not wanting to share information um you know some it, it is you know because it is an art art is anal business um <laughs> you know with creative people and egos i'm never involved. gonna not see that, that right way now i'm sorry uh, i ruined that word for you guys or, or I maybe mean, i didn't it. like it to begin with <laughs> <laughs> but like every it's an industry full of like ego and artistry and there are going to be some people who play things pretty close to the chest or the vest or however the fucking saying goes. I hate it. Um, <laughs> and like, I remember Mike and I like first boss, someone would, would ask, you know, they, someone who enjoyed the, the beer, you know, a fan, someone who was like, Hey, I love Sterling. this. I, I love this IPA. What hops are in it? And they would just go, Oh, just the sea hops. And if we asked them to like, you know what it was to go tell the customer at the bar they'd be like just tell them the sea hops like it's not the fucking colonel's 11 herbs and spices it's not the formula <laughs> for coca-cola get over yourself right you know what i mean and i gave away a secret ingredient just there <laughs> and <laughs> i mean like re realistically there was one time where i didn't you know i used to tell people on tours like i can tell you fucking everything that's in these beers legally like i signed an nda where i can't give you a recipe but you know i can still tell you everything that's in this and tell you how to do it and you know good luck actually recreating it at home or on a different system or you know it, it it's it's not that anything i make is is so secretive or, or so special that you can't redo it it's just there's all these different little nuances that are just never going to make it biochemically the identical thing. You know what I mean? So it doesn't yeah. matter to me. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, there, there, was, there was just one time where I did not want to give that information up. And that was, and I hope this person doesn't have it, but at my former brewery that closed down another brewer, like a brewery owner who claims to be a brewer uh, came in <laughs> to like, came in as like a consultant to like spritz the place up and clean the tanks and all that kind of shit. And like, I prayed that this motherfucker did not get his hands on the recipes. Cause like, you know, good luck brewing them. I don't care. But like, I just, I was just like, not that asshole. Sure. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, like, I just, I don't want that person having it. You know, when I, when I was early on in, in beer, I remember like uh, stone arrogant bastard. Like you, you go on their website and they tell you grain bills and, and, and hot profiles for almost every beer, except for arrogant bastard. They're like top secret. And I'm like, so, what the fuck is. So I actually, I don't know if you guys know this. So stone did a thing where arrogant bastard went on tour. So I feel like I remember that. So uh, arrogant bastard, they would, they would select breweries that got to. Uh, brew arrogant bastard and do like oh no i did not know about that yeah so so they selected breweries that that did a limited release it was it was taproom only you couldn't put it in a can you couldn't it was not like a collaboration it was literally arrogant bastard goes on the road and small craft breweries brew arrogant bastard badger hmm. hill was selected to do that oh really uh, and so we had some pretty serious NDAs about the recipe and the process and all of that for <laughs> Arrogant Bastard. Uh, and, and Greg, uh, his wife is from Minnesota, actually. So it, Oh, really? Yeah, so it just so happened. Like, he didn't go around all these, 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 these brews and beers and all this stuff. Um, but we were the only one in Minnesota doing it, and he happened to be here to go to his, his wife's family cabin or something like that. Or I don't, whatever. Anyway, of course so, he is. Yeah, and so he came in. He came in to to um to taste our version of it and all of that stuff. But yeah, the amount of secrecy around that. Um, and I even remember at like feeling at the time, I'm like, man, 
you're treating this like your recipe for a cheeseburger is so special. And I'm like, yeah, it's a ground beef patty with cheese, lettuce, and tomato on a bun. Like, like, yeah, maybe you do it slightly different, but I guess there's a reason it's called arrogant bastard. Is maybe yeah. <laughs> the best way I can put that. <laughs> but on the on the flip side of the whole thing, we have someone like uh, like our friend John Laffler, who has secret ingredients listed on their can. Then they just list what they are. Yeah, as I say, he does that with his tongue firmly planted in the side of his cheek. Yeah, right. and I, I, I love and I loved hearing because John's one of few people who I have ever seen openly talk about like conversations with the TTB about label approval and stuff. And the fact that I enjoy, I enjoy knowing where the TTB stands on things. It's a weird thing that I enjoy, but I feel like John and I are few people who are in that circle. So when yeah, he talks about the TTB, nerds. yeah. <laughs> when he talks about the TTB and them being like, you can't put that on there. Why? It's a joke. And them just being like, nah, like <laughs> it's. Yeah. You know, it was, it was fun to talk with him on, on bitter units. Uh, once again, bitter units available on Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere that you can download. Uh, please like, rate, subscribe. Uh, anyway. So when we had John Laffler on bitter units, uh, he did talk about a lot of those same things, right? Like, it's a, uh, it's a very like, you know, Joel said wearing it close to to the 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 vest. Uh, John wears it on his sleeve, right? Yeah. Like like he's putting it all out there, and that's one of the that's one of the seven reasons that I I love that man. He me he mentioned that a, a beer was a certain style because he didn't get a grain in time or, or he got the wrong, which was oh, one of the best jokes that I, I have heard in a long it time. Was, and uh, I almost drove off the road. It was a Flanders joke. Yeah. It's, uh, he, oh, a, he made a Flanders blonde because he didn't get enough of the, yeah. yeah uh, Fle Flemish Brown, uh, Flemish which Brown, is what yeah. you get when uh, you get the wrong order from your grain supplier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, God, I, man, I hate that guy for how brilliant he is sometimes. <laughs> Uh, I I know he doesn't listen to this podcast, so he's not going to hear the praise I'm giving him. <laughs> <laughs> I got to meet him uh, December 2019 when I was up in Chicago for the weekend, and he he took me and my wife around the brewery and just loved the place. I mean, such a sweet guy, so it, just totally awesome. And uh, what's funny is like when I was at Boulevardia, I think two years earlier. Um, we were in some bar, like they were having this big festival outside, but there was also like a bar set up just for the brewers and stuff. And uh, it was kind of like round, like in a circle. So I'm on one end and he's like across from me on the other end of the circle. And I mean, I, I couldn't say hi. Like I, I, I was such a pussy that day. Like, you know, <laughs> like I just, I wanted to go say hello. We had followed each other online for a while and yeah. definitely interacted online. I just did not have the courage to go over and say, Hey, I actually had a very similar experience with Joel uh, years ago, back in like 2000, I don't know, 12 or 13. So you were at uh, GABF with one of your previous uh, breweries. <laughs> that which we do not speak. Yes. I, well, Good I'm job not... on following uh, with the, the guides on here. <laughs> so uh, a certain uh uh place of previous employment you were at gabf and i uh, and i had posted a picture or something on twitter of me drinking a beer like you were in the background or whatever and you're like why didn't you come say hi i'm like well i did come have your beer i just wasn't gonna say hi because i didn't want to be like hi i follow you on twitter can i like can, can did we... i give you the beer because i was probably there with him no, no that yeah. wasn't it that wasn't that one it, you because you and i you and i did a gabf together him was it me and him it was just you joel you were the only one there when that i that makes when sense I oh maybe i was uh... <laughs> 
Cause I know like you and I, and the owner and his wife, we were, we were there for one GABF. I don't remember what year it was either 13 or 14, but maybe I, went, I was out like, like moseying around or something. I, I thought I, I went mosey. in 2013 with the, uh, Jedi brewer, uh, who we won't oh, name. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's what I'm pretty sure I was with and thank I, thank God Tim didn't ask him for a beer. <laughs> someone who someone who trained me we were both mike me him and a bunch of other people were all day one people and including this guy he eventually was the one to train me when i first came into the brew house and then i ended up years later firing him for just years of fucking incompetence and endangering no book uh, yeah <laughs> of all of I, his stuff I feel like I told this story recently, so I'm sorry if anyone's hearing this again, but like the owners fucking loved this kid for some reason. I don't know why he broke everything he fucking touched and he fixed everything with a piece of wood. Like it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Like it was a running joke in the brewery. Like if he was tasked with doing any like maintenance type thing, a piece of wood would be involved. We used to call a guy zip tie. So yeah, I get that. <laughs> I like that one better. Um, like he, he built one. I don't know what the name of the game is, but it's like the, the metal ring on a string that you bimini. try to catch bimini uh, like ring bimini ring or something. Okay. Like that. He built one in the brewery and like, it just didn't work. Like he didn't test it. It, it didn't, it was almost like a rigged carnival game. Like there was no fucking chance in hell you were ever gonna, <laughs> you know, get this ring on the hook. So you worked at a county fair, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah probably. Definitely a fucking <laughs> mismatching tables and chairs and everything. <laughs> oh. By the way. Oh, yeah. nice, nice. God, this 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 is a summer beer, Domingo. All right. Um, yeah, we didn't talk about what we're drinking today. Yeah, I, I want to go last. Going off the rails. I'm actually gonna run and grab. Uh, another beer here really quick. I realized I didn't have it, so I will be right back. So talk amongst yourselves. And now a word from Me Undies. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if Me Undies wants to sponsor the show, please contact us at info at unitedwedrink.com. By the way, sure I meant that to... Me Undies upper management is listening to this show. <laughs> Did I send you the clip of the Family Guy podcast episode where they're reading ads? No. Oh my God. I'm going to send this to you right after the show. I saw like, I'm always the last one to like, you know, in, in, in my marriage, I, I guess I don't know how to put it, but like, I'll be the, the last one to come to bed. Like I'm just an insomniac. I'm always doing shit. Usually at the end of the night, I'm like doing the dishes, the laundry or something's got to be done for the next day. So, you know, half the time she's asleep when I get up here and she has to sleep with the TV on. She just can it's something's got to be on. And usually it's got to be something like lighthearted or whatever. So almost every night family guy is on. And the other night I came to bed and I saw one of the greatest clips in family guy history where they're doing a podcast, but reading like ads for like me undies and like all the things Stamps. like all the dot com. Yes. All of that. <laughs> like, like what, like a uh, square space or whatever it was. <laughs> it was such a good like minute and a half. It was just brilliant. Uh, can 100% guarantee that you will never hear a Squarespace sponsorship on this show because they're way too expensive for just one website. How much are we talking here? They like they charge like 20 to 30 bucks a month for one site. I I have I have this website. I have I mean, not it, not including our podcast spacing, uh, because like those files have to be hosted elsewhere. But like, I have the website for this site, my uh, my Mike Loves Beer blog, my brother's blog. I have uh, my old podcast uh, still hosted on there. I have like six websites hosted for nine dollars a month. Uh, on a true hosting service and i use wordpress for every single one of those sites the the like i get the squarespace thing i do like it is pretty cool and intuitive and tim just walked back into was, a conversation like, did i, did, did I just like, come into a different why are you guys podcast? shitting did, all over did, did, did i leave a beer podcast and come back into a, a nerd website hosting podcast i'm very <laughs> confused 
You interrupted the ads. <laughs> Am I on a wrong on the wrong channel? Is that what this is? <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, Square Squarespace has its 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 purpose in space, but it'll never it won't be this space because I can do what I want with WordPress. <laughs> so, so Tim, not what, sponsored uh, by WordPress. <laughs> Tim, what uh, what did you go grab to drink? So I grabbed. Uh, Bad Weather Brewing Sun Pillar. This is a beer. Actually, uh, Joel, you I think you've had Andy's beer before. Andy. So, Andy Ruland. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I follow yeah, so, him so, on so he, Yeah, so he used to brew at what was at the time known as Lucid, and he had a beer called uh, Gosler, which was a Goza, uh, that I want to say made it to an event that, that you guys might have been at, and I remember you actually commenting on it and all excited to see my buddy Andy's beer uh, wherever you were. Um, but uh, they are a brewery in St. Paul. They're, they're sort of a sister brewery to Badger Hill. They, they kind of came out of the same thing. They were both all propping at, at Lucid at the time. Um, but he's one of the guys that I probably talk to uh, three to 12 times a week about anything going on or get advice from. He makes some great, some fantastic loggers in the city. And I appreciate how much loggers have taken off here in, in Minnesota and how great of a job that we're doing with them. Uh, but this is actually a Belgian blonde that they used to make more regularly and is kind of, it, I've said on bitter units, it's on my desert island list. It's one of those summer crushers that is just so well done. You get that Belgian malt, you get that kind of bubble gum and clove uh, Belgian character with that that Belgian pill that pills and malt that it's like the right amount without being too much. And I could just probably drink 7,000 of them if I was stuck <clears> on <throat> a desert island. And it's only like 5%. It's, it's the absolute perfect summer crusher. So crusher, God damn it. I hate myself. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, someone just put me out to pasture, uh, but it is one of those things where I could drink a lot of them. So uh, I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm very, very, very happy to see it back in cans. Dude, if that's uh, if that's what you're into, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna when I send you, I've got a we've got a batch of our single in the sun. It's a Belgian blonde. It's four and a half percent. If if that's what you dig, I'm definitely we we got a batch in the tank right now that we're gonna bottle. So I'm gonna I'm gonna send you that. I I would not kick it out of bed for eating crackers. I'm sure. And what's funny is our version with guava puree of the same exact beer has completely eclipsed our main like core flagship number one beer and we fucking can't make enough of it it's ridiculous you know you put f- fruit puree in a beer and and uh <laughs> welcome to florida <laughs> <laughs> well, shit. well like welcome to, to minnesota i still i wrote an article for, for tailgate society i'm like when does beer quit being beer when it slowly starts to become a tgi friday's menu <clears throat> right um <laughs> I, i'm not against fruit and beer at all i'm not against fruit puree and beer i you know i love a good lambic i i love just a um a beta used to do a strawberry blonde thing. yeah yeah just so gorgeous it was just a kiss of strawberry that was amazing um and then, like, the next year, like, it was like, okay, they went a little heavier handed because people want, like, you know. Heavy hands? They want, very, <laughs> yes, they do, right? Right? We can't, you know, we're not going to have uh, uh, fruit flavored cigars in, in, in convenience stores Pumpkin anymore. Spice to everything. Well, because fruit flavored cigars are gonna go, going to appeal to kids. Uh, so just, go ahead and pour me another ecto cooler beer and we can talk more about how we shouldn't target kids with, with marketing in, in other industries. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it does not surprise me, but I would take, I would take either the guava or just, just a, a light, easy drinking 
uh, Belgian light beer uh, that I could drink. Man, I'm not even going to complain about the weather. You guys are in Florida. <laughs> uh, what's what's your phrase about weather doesn't, uh, Joel? Neil oh, Rogers the late, quote. The late, great Neil Rogers said, good weather is no substitute for quality of life. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's fucking too hot here already. Well, listen, the past this few week days... Wasn't, this, this week wasn't bad. We had a lot of wind. God damn it, Mike. You know how I feel about talking weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'm anyway. drinking Bad Weather Beer is what I wanted to say. The name of the brewery that Andy Ruland brews for is Bad Weather. So that's a good segue back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I have a set. I had a 750 of Plowman Cider's Churchyard, uh, an eight and a half percent cider uh, that I took to the dome. And now I'm on the New Belgium Dominga Mimosa Sour uh, that I was totally sold on by you guys on Bitter Units. Yeah, yeah. For your listeners, uh, please, if you're going to listen to one episode of Bitter Units, do that because we actually had Joel as our guest host on Bitter Units. JT unfortunately couldn't join us, and so I asked Joel to step in, and he did a great job. I was dumb enough to actually ask Joel to step in on a day when our guest's name was Joel because <laughs> I didn't have any forethought about how the hell that would go down. It was like Highlander. <laughs> there can only be one. <laughs> what was uh, it? Joel win and Joel lose? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, but that Dominga Sour is, uh, holy shit, that's a... What about I, you, Joel? Are yeah. you did you drink anything, or are you taking the day off after yesterday? Yeah, uh, for those that uh, for those listening that uh, do not know what Mike is talking about, I went a little hard yesterday at three new breweries. Uh, one was technically not new; I just had never been there. Uh, I'm ashamed to admit, but uh, I was brewing hop brewery hopping around on a day off, and uh, I have had a very weird relationship with alcohol lately because. I've found that I have a much higher tolerance for it, which I don't understand, but I will not start feeling those, you know, sort of sedative effects. And it just sort of acts as like the social lubricant it is, you know? So like all of a sudden I'll be at work and I, I'll, I'll have had like two or three shift beers and I feel totally fine, but I realize I'm talking a lot and I'm like, Oh shit, I got to stop drinking. And like, I, like I don't feel drunk at all like believe me i know what it feels like so it's it, so it, it's been really weirding me out and uh so yesterday you know, you know on a day off where i had nothing to do and you know i could have gone anywhere and done anything uh you know one of those rare weekday day offs for me so i figure fuck it i'm gonna go check out a few breweries see you know some people i haven't seen in a long time have some beers and uh the tolerance just completely got away from me and I fucking way overdid it. And I was all sorts of fucked up yesterday and uh, just feel horrible about it. Like <laughs> your guys are going to love this. I, you know, of course, you know, after you've had some beers, the natural instinct is to have some Taco Bell. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hit up Taco Bell. I ordered three hard tacos, three crunchy tacos and one Nacho Bell Grande with no uh, refried beans or tomatoes. And it's, it's not a flavor thing. It's just a texture thing, but I digress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously, you know, I'm eating in my car, like a total fucking pig, there's cheese flying everywhere. Uh, and uh, then I get to, you know, I save the nachos for last. Cause I kind of like them a little half soggy. And uh, I go, I, I go to reach for the nacho bel grande uh, and somehow like I end up flipping it upside down and now it's on my right leg <laughs> and I just proceeded to eat it off my right leg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's, that was when I knew like I got to make some changes. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I'm having polar uh, lime seltzer. Uh, I did bring uh, a truly fruit punch because I've been I've been looking everywhere for these. 
Uh, I don't remember exactly just what for it was. motivation. It's just been sitting there on your desk. Yeah. And amazingly, like does not get warm. Like this is colder than the waters I took out. Uh, but pure glycol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I did take two sips to this of this cause I had to know and Holy fuck. Is it sweet? Like stevia is the last ingredient listed on the ingredients. And of course, you know, it goes in order of like what's mostly in it. So it starts yeah. with filtered water and ends with sweetener. And this tastes like there's more sweetener than water. Um, and I love these fucking truly lemonades, but holy shit. Like I, if I had a slushy machine game on, like I would just dump the whole case into that thing. But um, as just like a, I cannot imagine like being out in the heat, drinking one of these fruit punch seltzers. It is so ungodly sweet. Do I is, is there a a Belgian version of seltzer that that Barrel of Monks could could make? Actually, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of our owners uh, wants to uh, make a little seltzer in like a side project, you know, a separate company kind of thing. Do I have and, to edit this out later? Why? I don't know. I don't know if this is public information. Yeah, it, it's you know, whatever. I mean, uh, well, anyway, one of the owners. Uh, I'll find out tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, for his side project uh, doing seltzer, uh, bought an alchemator, which is just this giant machine with all these massive filters that will take any beer you brew and strip it down to hard seltzer. So like sure. out, one end, out one end comes, you know, hard seltzer and the other is like basically non-alcoholic beer, I guess. Uh, I was, it's only been done once at the brewery. I was not there for it. It all happened before I got there. Uh, and apparently no one knows how to use this machine now. Uh, but we'll figure it out. And, uh, but we did, we, we, I guess they brewed a batch of that single. I was talking to you, to you about, I think that's what it was. Uh, cause it was just kind of, I guess the most basic it's right there in the alcohol content and everything. So, um, uh, so it did have a, when, when I first tried it, I tried it with no flavoring, you know, they invited me over and, and, you know, I was hanging out in the brewery and the former brewer, uh, let me try it. And, it was very, very good. I mean, it was hard seltzer, but it did have kind of like a Belgian bubblegummy thing going on. And, you know, we've learned since because we, you know, we basically kegged off all that raw seltzer and like, you know, flavored it different ways, keg by keg and shit like that. So uh, and then we did a small batch um, of cans of, of the mojito seltzer. But we had learned, I guess, or they had learned that you just, you know, scrub out that bubblegummy thing by just, you know, scrubbing it with CO2. Mm hmm. But uh, we actually have a like an ale, like a kind of a neutral ale that we brewed uh, in a 20 barrel tank that uh, is looking to get turned into hard seltzer soon. But it won't be Belgian by any means. Those uh, those things, I'm familiar with those. Uh, the the cleaner the beer going in, obviously, the cleaner the, the seltzer coming out and also uh, just the better the non-alcoholic beer is. A lot of times the beers that go in. Uh, might produce an okay seltzer, but the non-alcoholic version coming out is not, um, not great. Uh, so I'd be curious to, to know what a Belgian beer going in comes out at, as seltzer. But I will take a a, a Belgian seltzer, uh, or, or whatever that looks like. Uh, <laughs> by any means. Then we'll have a Belgian hazy seltzer and then <laughs> smoothie uh, seltzer, pastry seltzer. Today, uh, today on Instagram, I saw an Imperial smoothie seltzer. And it, it's like you're the whole point of a seltzer is that it's lighter, clear, you know, clean. more health conscious, you know, low carbs, low sugar. So, you know, oh, oh, but I'm sorry, it's craft. We're innovating. Well, like like I said, it's all a TGI Fridays menu, right? <laughs> at, at this point, they're all just like, when when does someone pop a, uh, a a slim can and it starts singing "Happy Happy Birthday" from all of us to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, we we were at a we were at a Ruby Tuesdays one time, and it's basically the same fucking restaurant. And uh, I was coming back from the bathroom just a to few our... days earlier. What? <laughs> Just a few days earlier um, or uh, later, whichever yeah. way you want to look at it. <laughs> well, I'm coming back from the bathroom. Uh, like I come out of the bathroom door right as the fucking parade. Cause they start singing like in the kitchen, 
Yeah. You know, and they, they make it this whole parade where they, they all walk out and oh, sing. Please from... tell me you got caught into it. Well, I was I was kind of like the caboose on that train. Like I just joined <laughs> along. I start clapping my hands and singing and shit. My wife was dying. I mean, like it was kind of perfect. I had to do it. That, that is great. Oh, man. Um, so I feel like we we kind of uh, are ending here with what we would begin with. But uh also i think we should give tim like the ability for a last call and to plug and to do all of that stuff because I, I think we're we're running a little long here um tim you know how last calls work but just in case anyone's a new listener last calls is a thing on this show where we give people the opportunity to express their opinion on a topic doesn't have to be beer related, can be unopposed, uninterrupted for however long they want. So please do, Tim, give us a last call and then go ahead and plug whatever you want to plug. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you. Um, the thing that has been bugging me lately because it is something that I've been dealing with lately is all of the little things the little things that I think people kind of get complacent about. There are a lot of things that you can do in brewing that you can ignore, that you can skip doing, that you can not do, whether that's a conversion test or, you know, maybe I'm not checking gravity this day or maybe I'm missing this or that or whatever. I feel like there has been recently and probably because of the pandemic that people have had to take a lot of shortcuts. And so they've cut out the things that feel superfluous when they don't matter. But the problem is that shit matters when something goes wrong. So all of those things when you are brewing that you feel like it's a waste of time because it's repetitive and we don't ever do anything with that. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter if everything is going right, but the second something doesn't go right, it's going to matter. So get used to doing boring, repetitive shit if you're in brewing because it's the best thing that you can do. The first thing you can do for consistency is do everything boring and repetitive because it's going to be the best thing that you can do. I. Uh, Brewing is fun and it's sexy and it's romantic, but it's also boring and non-romantic and mechanical. And that's the best part about it. So any kind of aspiring brewer out there or whatever, embrace the boring, I guess is what I would say, because I'm right now paying the price of not having the boring, repetitive things done that I'm trying to help solve. So that, that I think... Uh, is Dave Berg said today, uh, there are two types of breweries, those who have micro problems and those that are going to have micro problems. And I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense for sure. So that's, that's my last call. Uh, as far as plugs, uh, please check us out on the web at betterunits.com. Follow us on Twitter at Bitter Units. We are not on Instagram because we are old and don't understand how things work. I am, if you can find me, I got locked out of one Instagram account. I remember the name of my other Instagram account because I, again, I don't know how the things work, but I am Tim Johnson MN on Twitter. So follow me, yell at me, tell me how dumb I am. And I will just make a Wilson Phillips joke uh, when you respond. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that part of your account right now. <laughs> So yeah, that, that's what I got. Well, thank you for that. We uh, also need actually, Tim's uh, Taco Bell order. Oh yeah, we do. Uh, you're going to Taco Bell. What is your order? Uh, so the other day I was drinking and I wondered why uh, Taco Bell doesn't make a brunch wrap supreme. <laughs> and, maybe, and maybe they do, but like a crunch wrap supreme, but with like, with like, holy <laughs> fuck. 
like, literal like, mind blown. Like like hash browns and and scrambled eggs in a crunch wrap supreme, a brunch wrap supreme, I think sounds amazing. So if that already exists, I apologize for inventing something that already exists, but I'm on Twitter and that's what we do on Twitter. <clears throat> um, but if not, Taco Bell, if you're listening, please make a brunch wrap supreme. Uh, um, otherwise, yeah, I know it's a very popular choice, but man, I'm I'm gonna crunch wrap supreme, or I'm gonna eat nachos al grande off of Joel's lap. <laughs> 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 well on that bombshell uh joel you want to you want to say something listen i had a last call but i'm going to change it right now i'm going to call an audible here tim you got to pursue this brunch wraps this this has got to be like a viral campaign remember like that kid who kept uh trying to get free nuggets from wendy's like that's what this needs to become. We can get people behind this. There are a lot, the, the, there's an intersection of brunch and beer people. Uh, I think you were saying that on your, you said something about brunch before. Uh, I feel like it was like that, but this could go viral. This could actually happen. We need to get behind this. We need to have a campaign, uh, <laughs> hashtag brunch wrap Supreme. Like this, this could be a thing. It's got like, we're, we're, Mike and I are sitting here with our fucking minds blown, like so obvious and, and didn't think of it. And th this has got to be a thing. We, we're, we're starting a new podcast right now. It is uh, the three of us, and we just come up with ideas for big corporations. <laughs> um, <laughs> they just pay us in free stuff. Or money. I, hey, Probably man, free I, stuff more. I can live but, off uh, of Brunch Rap Supremes. I think that'd be great. <laughs> Or they're going to say, hey, can you move some of those ideas over so I can park my boat in here? <laughs> <laughs> Which I absolutely love uh, how much you and I have just given our, like, it's been like, fuck it. Let's just voice some of our <clears throat> frustrations with our previous brewery over the last week. Well, I, I just fun. feel because it's for the betterment of the industry that people understand how certain businesses behave internally. I mean, we've already seen the worst parts of it in the past weeks, but, yeah. you know, and I did not want to divert attention away or anything, but I did want to say like, hey, you know, if you think these things are bad, which they fucking absolutely are, there's also another section of this of like safety issues and horrible pay and no living wages and you know, someone who fucking spends 12 hours a day breaking their back shouldn't have to, you know, wait until the food truck opens at four to eat breakfast for fuck's sake. Like, like I've like seen it, that happen. And like it's, it's basically the, hey, you're amazed that this, this industry is run by assholes. Well, no shit. Have you seen how they've acted like assholes in every other aspect of how they run a business? Right. That actually reminds me something you were saying earlier, Tim. But you were on a roll, so I didn't want to uh, interrupt you. <laughs> that, like the Germans bomb Pearl Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like when you were talking about the whole local thing, uh, like assholes are local too. They're yeah. not just nationally, like on TV, on CNN, on our TVs all the time. There are assholes who are specific to your local area all the fucking time Shit, so just because you're local doesn't mean you can't be a fucking asshole all right that's a new t-shirt that's a new t-shirt we need assholes are local too <laughs> <laughs> uh i i you know i'm, I'm gonna pass on last call this week because i was gonna do something lighthearted, and with all of this like it just seems dumb uh so Tim, thank you for, for being here. I really hope Joel didn't have any computer problems this time recording this call. Still recording. Sweet. <laughs> um, because I fucking love talking with you. And uh, Joel, anything else you want to say before we shove off? No, I just want to say thanks to Tim for joining us. This was such a blast. Sometimes when we have a guest it, even even though we we know each other and we get along sometimes it just feels a little awkward you know especially if it's like you know a, a 
like a brewer we look up to and, and kind of feels a little more Hollywood than we are. Um, and, you know, yeah. it's just, it, it's fun talking to you, man. And, and, you know, we love you guys at, at bitter units and I want to keep our charity thing going. Like I love the whole relationship we have with this whole thing. And, it, you know, it's just great talking to you, man. No, I, I'm, I, guys, I'm really flattered and humbled that you had me on as a guest. I, I, I appreciate that, that, you're not uh, intimidated or uh, that you look up to me in any way, shape or form so that you feel more comfortable. Uh, That's fantastic. I mean, Joel Uh, looks up to a lot of people. Dude, I'm five, six, so I'm not going to say anything (laughs) about this shit. Um, No, I seriously, one of my favorite things about you guys and that I feel like at bitter units, we feel about you guys, but just me personally with you guys is that, it just feels like friends, right? And so yeah. for me, this wasn't, hey, we're going to get together and talk. It's just, hey, you guys want to go grab a beer later and, and, and shoot the shit? And that's what this is. So yeah. uh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for everything that you guys have done for Bitter Units. I'm so grateful that I can bounce questions off you guys, whether it be, uh, hey, Mike, how do you get sponsors on a podcast? Or even, hey, Joel, how are you dealing with this problem at your brewery? Like, you guys are resources and friends first and foremost. So thank you very, very, very much. Oh, yeah. And when we're done here, you got to send me Aaron's address so I can invoice him for all the help that we've done for uh, their <laughs> units. Yeah, you were gonna you were gonna send it to me the other day but i just you know since we're talking. <laughs> i love it i love it uh love you aaron hope you're doing well uh thanks man uh it, it really just means a lot to just get together on while we're doing this saturday evening and just fucking bullshitting between some friends yeah man i i, I love you guys and then that, that's not even beer talking. That's just genuinely, <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate you guys. So thank you very much. Love you too, right. man. Joel, cut it before we get way too intimate. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing nobody can see the video. <laughs> Thank you once again to Tim for joining us on the show this week. It was long overdue. Glad that we got to actually get it accomplished this time technologically. We we did talk last time, but uh, let's get everything else out of the way. Follow us on social media at United We Drink on Twitter at United We Drink Pod on Instagram. We're also on Facebook. Our website is unitedwedrink.com. You can subscribe to the show in one of many different fashions. All of the major podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, we, they all have the show available for you. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please drop us a rating of five stars if you really like us. If you don't, four is all right, too. Um, below that, don't even bother. Uh, but if you have a few seconds That's all it takes to do that rating. We appreciate that. And if you have a little bit more than a few seconds, a review would be awesome as well. Um, If you want to support the show financially, there is our sponsors, as we mentioned at the top of the show. You know, we drink.com slash sponsors that you can visit and uh, give business to some awesome folks. And by doing so, you support this show. If you follow those links on that page, you can also buy a T-shirt button sticker or tote or anything from the uh, web store, unitedwedrink.com slash store. In the meantime, we will be back here in two weeks for another episode for Joel, for Tim, for even Phil. Yes, we're going to say his name on here. Uh, Thank you, everyone. We'll see you then. Cheers. So, you know. Oh, yeah? Yeah.
Yeah, is that useful to you? Oh, you betcha, yeah. Yeah. 